Join me in John chapter 6, if you will. John chapter 6. You heard these verses read just a moment ago. I'll tell you what excites me about these verses. I love the message of verse 2. A large crowd followed Jesus because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. But this is not an uncommon statement in the Gospels, is it not? There's a crowd following Jesus. If you and I were citizens of first century Palestine, undoubtedly a lot of us would be doing the same. They're following Jesus because of all the signs he performed on the sick. This word sign in the Gospel of John represents uh, that which the word miracle doesn't fully satisfy. Signs are representing these miraculous events Jesus performed that point to his full power and his identity. So the large crowd is pressing in on Jesus. A recent study from one of the religion departments of a neighboring seminary has reported from a recent survey that 73% of all physicians believe in miracles. I find that a bit refreshing. So yes, amen. But I want to ask you a very simple question. Do you, do you believe in miracles? In fact, I'll go a little further, and I'll ask you something a bit more personal. I'm wondering if you believe in what I like to term the, the greater miracle. Now, I know we have miracles that are ocular, like those that we're about to look at in the Scripture. But I wonder if you truly believe in the miracle that God does through Christ that is personal, internal, and supernatural. You see, if I were to canvas and say, how many of you believe in miracles? We'd all raise our hands, and undoubtedly most would say, yes, I'm convicted. Jesus still does miracles today. But if I were to ask, do you believe that he wants to do something personal and supernatural in you right now? Maybe we're not so convicted because to think that God would do something supernatural in somebody so normal, or maybe even our own self-perception would say subnormal, is that even possible? So I want to ask you to lean in for just a moment to these two stories, the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water, because I, I want to share with you that these two stories demonstrate Jesus interacting with his disciples about what's going on internally. He desired that they truly engage the miracle. So look for a moment at the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Look for a moment at the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. Can you see those scenes being displayed in the pages of Scripture? Can you see how real those stories were? And yet, in both of these and in all the miracles, Jesus' primary concern was not to give the crowd an ocular sensation. His primary concern was not the event itself. Every single miracle of our Lord would demonstrate that His primary concern was the faith of those who had become the human context of the miracle. So for those who witnessed the miracle firsthand, those who saw it from a distance, Jesus' concern was not that they have an experience of sensationalism, but that they truly understand who Jesus is and how he wants to change them internally, move deeply in their lives. So I invite you to John chapter 6, and I want to show you something in verse 3. Uh, verse 2 said the large crowd followed, but look at verse 3. Then Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Jesus is about to do something that would demonstrate his heart of the spiritual growth of his disciples more than them just encountering the miracle. I love how Philip Brooks writes this. Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger people. Do not pray for a task that would equal your power. Pray for a power that would equal your task. Then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, you shall be the miracle. Did you hear that? What an incredible statement. Don't pray for life to be easy. Pray that your life would be made stronger. 
Don't pray for a task, that, a power that would equal the task. Pray for, pray for a power that would, would satisfy the task because in doing this, it's not just that our work becomes the miracle, but we ourselves become the miracle. I believe that's what God really wanted to see in the lives of his disciples, so they would recognize the impact and the difference he could make in their lives. So I want to ask you to join me in looking at how Jesus impacted their lives. There are five ways, maybe more, but I want to share five ways that Jesus impacted their lives uh, through the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water. I know the crowds involved, and don't, don't misunderstand me, this is an important scene for the crowd as well. But later in chapter 6, you'll see Jesus teaching the crowd and the Jewish leaders and the disciples about what it means to follow him, to follow Jehovah. Here, before that teaching, Jesus pulls his disciples back to a hillside to make certain that they do not miss internally what is about to be proven of Jesus' identity and power. I pray you not miss this either. These miracles, as others in the Scripture, are not the framework snapshot that we look at as, as one event to be sensationalized with, but as a testimony to how Jesus wants to accomplish his will and his uh, perfect way in our lives and in our hearts. So, uh, number one, how did Jesus impact life of his disciples in, the mir in these miracles? First, he centered their focus on the spiritual impact of the moment. He centered their focus on the spiritual impact of the moment. Verse 1, Jesus has moved to the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, Tiberias, named after an emperor in AD 20, but known in this present context as the Sea of Galilee. And on that northeastern slope, a large crowd is following him. Verse 3, we've already read, Jesus retreated to the mountain. The reason this crowd is pressing in is because if you harmonize this passage with the remainder of the Gospels, you'll see something phenomenal. You'll, you'll see that between chapter 5 and 6 of John, history records that Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount then. Uh, all the Gospels harmonizing together teach us these things. That Jesus, uh, he raised up the, the, the widow's son from the dead. He healed the Roman centurion's servant. He cast the demons out of the uh, man from the gatherings and, and sent them into the pigs. All of these things are happening in Galilee proper. And this crowd is fascinated. They're pressing in. And Jesus says to his disciples, let's retreat here. Jesus sits down, and as Jesus sits down, the indication is, especially according to rabbinic tradition, he's about to teach them. Now, if you press rabbinic tradition in detail, a lot of settings would have their rabbi seated and everyone else standing. Next Sunday, we're going to try that. Are y'all game? No, I'm not joking. We're not going to try that. wouldn't work here in this present culture, but in, in Jesus' day, a lot of times the rabbi would be seated and he would teach. So when Scripture says Jesus went to this hillside and sat down, the disciples knew he's about to point our minds to something that we need to engage. He centered their focus on the spiritual impact of the moment. Now, here's a couple of questions that will help us here. How did he do this and why? How? Well, he asked them to sit down. He created a pause where a pause was needed so that he could make certain that he structured their minds and guided their hearts to see what he wanted them to see. I sometimes fear that I miss what God is speaking because I'm not allowing him to hit the pause in my life. Jesus hit the pause and they sat down so that he could instruct his disciples to see what he desired that they would see. Uh, so that's how Jesus did this. How did he center their focus? He quietened them. Uh, why did he do this? This might even be the greater of the two questions. I mean, the crowd's coming in, and every entrepreneurial mind in the room would say to someone like Jesus, if the crowd is coming in, don't focus on the 12, focus on the 10,000. This is your moment. Instead, if they're pressing, he first took his disciples against all human reasoning and thought. Why did he do this? I, I think the whole chapter would teach us this. You know, I could trace with you through the remainder of this chapter. We could stop at verse 26 and 27. We could read on forward to verse 31 through 32, verse 48 through 51, even over to verse 58. And the entire chapter from this point on would demonstrate that although Jesus is about to give natural bread to the, to the multitude, his purpose was that this would be emblematic and would point to his own life being the living bread. From this point forward, Jesus champions and he elevates the reality that he himself is the living bread that satisfies, that fulfills, in fact, later in the gospel, much later, 
John chapter 20, verse 31 through 32. We'll get to John chapter 20 in the year 2025, I promise you. But in John chapter 20, in John chapter 20, verse 31 and 32, this is what we're told. John writes, these miracles, many of them have not even been recorded here, but were done in the presence of the disciples. Why? And they're recorded, but there are many that are recorded here so that you can believe that Jesus is God's Son. And believing in his name, you might have life. Well, the reason Jesus brought the disciples over was to say exactly what John would later write about. He wanted his disciples to see that in him, in Jesus, is life. And it's life abundant and overflowing where nothing stands dissatisfied when the focus is on the living bread, Jesus himself. So that's why he sat them down, so that they would see the reality of who Christ is truly is. Jesus centered their focus upon what would happen in the midst of this miracle, the true identity of who Christ is as the living bread. Why did he do this? Uh, we've answered that. How? We've answered that. But notice Jesus is not satisfied just to leave them sitting. I know sometimes uh, church worship services or mission trips or other events can become uh, uh, predominantly in our focus just the event. And there's always a spiritual impact God wants to do that, that far outshadows the event itself. And that's what's happening here. So what exactly did Jesus desire to do in the life of his disciples? Well, the second impact teaches us this. As we read on, secondly, the, Jesus impacted the disciples by building their faith. And we see this in verses 5 through 9. And notice how the story unfolds. I love the dialogue of what's going on here. Verse 5 and Jesus lifted his eyes and saw the crowd coming. So Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And Jesus was saying this to test Philip. And Philip answered, verse 7, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive even a little portion. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, found a little lad with a, a lunch of, of five barley loaves and two fish. And then Andrew himself, having found this in the large crowd, said, but what is this for so many people? I want to peek into verse 10 for just a moment. Verse 10 says this. Jesus said to the disciples, have everyone sit down. Now I want to show you how Jesus is building their faith. A couple of questions here are very important. What was Jesus building into their faith? And again, how did he do this? What was Jesus building into their faith? Notice Scripture says Jesus tested Philip. Uh, most scholarship would agree that although he points to Philip, the entire entourage of disciples are there, particularly the, 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 the core following is there. And so Jesus is saying to Philip so that all can hear, um, how, how, should we, how should we find bread for this group? Notice Jesus doesn't even begin to entertain the question, should we? But he asked Philip how, and Scripture says Jesus already knew what he would do, but he was testing Philip. This testing is not a trick. This testing is a challenge to the faith. So uh, what was Jesus building in their faith? Very, very simply, Jesus was building in them a brand new way of thinking. Do you understand that what Jesus wants from us is we begin to see life through his eyes, that he would indeed be our vision, that our, our cry would be that hymnal-like cry, be thou my vision. Jesus is wanting the disciples to see this episode as, as he sees the episode. He's teaching them how to think. He's teaching them to move to a missional way of thinking, for Jesus saw the crowd. But there was a little hang-up in their movement to thinking like Jesus. You know what it was? It, it was managerial thinking. Do you know what managerial thinking does? Well, this text just proved this. Managerial thinking says two things. Human reasoning says this can't happen, Human resource says this can't happen. Human reasoning from Philip. Well, if I work an entire year rounding out that amount with 200 denarii, a commoner's yearly wage, Philip is saying to Jesus, to his question, hey, where can we get bread? Jesus, I could work a year and I couldn't supply bread for what we need at this very moment. I don't think Philip is saying I'm not willing to do that. Philip is just saying... Common sense dictates we can't buy the bread. Managerial thinking. Also, managerial thinking was reflected with Andrew. 
Uh, Andrew was not necessarily championing human reasoning, but he was championing human resources. Well, this is all I found. I found a small lunch. Now, uh, the, the size of lunch and the age of the boy would indicate that this meal came from a very impoverished setting. The, the amount of fish that you would pull from the skeleton would probably amount to half a can of sardines, perhaps. The, the bread would, would not be this beautiful yeast-filled bread that we used to call cat head biscuits, that biscuits were the size of a catfish that had all the gooey stuff in the middle. So when you pulled it apart, you had all that uh, half-cooked dough that was hooked. No, the, this was just this was a simple uh, flat loaf. And so there's not a lot of food in this little lunch. And Andrew says, you're saying you want to feed everyone. Out of 10,000 people, here's your food. The human resource looks sad. The human reason looks very doubtful. Managerial thinking does this. It regulates. Managerial thinking makes things small and controllable. Jesus is looking at Philip and Andrew and the disciples with this question, how can we get the bread to test them to move in their thinking from managerial to missional, seeing it like Jesus sees the situation. So what was Jesus building? A new way of thinking. How did he do this? He challenged them at their point of faith, and he taught them to anticipate. That's how he did this. He challenged them by saying, hey, uh, you need to realize something else can happen that's beyond what you can reason or what you can resource. There's something else that can happen. Church, may I make a solid announcement? There's always a third option. And it is the best option. When we say human re reasoning doesn't make sense, human resource doesn't provide, what's left? <laughs> yes, you trust the master who is saying, I I've got this. And so Jesus, how did he build this faith? He challenged them at their point of faith, lovingly. I see no evidence of reprimanding these words, just a loving demonstration of drawing them in. So he challenged them at their point of faith. He, he gave them the opportunity to have a crisis of belief. I know it looks this way, but it really can't be this way. Are we going to trust the circumstance or are we going to trust the Christ? So that's how he, he challenged them at their point of faith, but he also taught them how to anticipate when he gave them the instruction. Hey, just tell them to sit down. You know, when you would ask someone to sit down in this culture, you were saying, I will take care of you. It was the chief act of hospitality. And I can imagine the disciples thinking, we're going to ask 10,000 people to sit down. And we've got some flatbread and sardines for, for one small boy. How will this work? And Jesus is building their faith. But I want to take you quickly to this third way Jesus impacted their life. He, he personally involved them. Jesus involved them personally in what he was about to do. Can I tell you three things that will happen when Jesus personally involves you? This is from verses 10 through 13. It happened to the disciples. It can happen to you and to me right now. When Jesus involves us, when we finally get to that point of realizing that Jesus has centered our attention on what really matters, and then he begins building our faith, he then wants to involve us in what he's doing. And there are three experiences anytime we're involved in the work of Jesus. Number one, pure obedience. Jesus said to them, have, have everyone sit down. They purely obeyed. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, we take every thought captive in our obedience to Christ. Did you hear that? Every thought we have that would say, I can't do this, this is impossible, this is unbelievable, we take that negative thought captive by saying, I'm just going to obey Jesus. And that's how we take those thoughts of doubt and frustration. That's how we take human reasoning captive by saying, it is ours to obey Christ, whatever he leads, and however he, he, he directs, we, we trust him. So there was pure obedience as the first experience when they were involved with Christ. Secondly, not only the experience of just purely obeying but there was the experience of much out of little. Did you see that? Jesus took the lunch and he held it up. And all four Gospels are in sync with this. He held the lunch up and the Scripture says, He called upon the Lord and blessed it. I believe what happened at that moment, because it can only happen through Jesus, God, pardon the English, got involved. God got involved. Jesus mirrored for the disciples, this is God. If you and I 
desire God to get involved because we see something that we can't handle that it can only come through Jesus Christ. Just ask David if little can become much. And in 2 Samuel 17, a little boy destroyed a big giant and the entire nation fled. Just ask Gideon in Judges 7, 7, can little become much? Yes, God said, I want you to take an army of 300 against an entire nation and I'll give you victory. I just want to make sure you know where the victory's coming from so you only need 300. Little can become much. Probably one of my favorite examples is is the more modest example of Mark chapter 12, verse 42, where the widow just put in a small, tiny thing, and Jesus said, now that's giving. Little becomes much when Jesus is the object of our obedience. So they experienced pure obedience. They experienced much out of little. But thirdly, when Jesus involved them in his work, they experienced blessings beyond what could be expected. I love this scene. Everyone ate. Most, most scholarship would indicate closer to 10,000 than 5,000 people. 10,000 people ate and were filled. And I can see the scene as it concludes. There are the 12 disciples, and they're all standing there with their baskets. Their baskets are running over. And they realize what Ephesians 3.20 proclaims. Jesus does much more than we could ever ask or imagine. So they were blessed beyond expectation. You see what Christ did for them? He centered their attention on what matters. He built their faith. And he involved them in his work. Do you know why Jesus did this? We're going to close with just glancing at the, at the second miracle. I believe the first one is a great commentary for the second. As we continue reading, I want to share with you the fourth and the fifth re- way that Jesus impacted the disciples. Uh, transition happens. The crowd is full. They press in, according to verse 14 and 15, to make Jesus king. He's met our needs. They say he's a prophet, referencing the prophet that Moses spoke about. They don't really see him as the Messiah yet. Jesus, harmonizing with the other Gospels, John teaches that Jesus sent the disciples back across the lake to Capernaum. He withdrew back to the mountain to pray alone. Now the disciples are three miles off, and the wind begins to blow. I want to quickly show you the fourth way Jesus involves himself in in this miraculous way with the disciples. The fourth way is this. He, He came to them. He proved his presence with them in the storm. He was, he was not only there when the plate was full, he was there when the wind blew hard. Can you imagine the disciples? I mean, just, just not that long ago, they're on the hillside and everyone has their, their belly full. I guess I can say that, belly. They're, they were full. Everyone had their, their fill. They were satisfied. Moments later, they're in a boat, the wind's blowing, And veteran fishermen who are in their element can't handle what's happening. I can imagine their thought is, uh, how did this happen? One minute it's great, the next minute it's not. Has it ever been an accurate commentary for life? One minute things are so well, the next minute it's like someone just flipped a switch and why is all of this wind and, and torrent blowing against me? This is what the disciples learned. Jesus was there. Can I give you three facts about your storm and my storm? Number one, they cause personal struggles. I know you're thinking, well, that's not a, that's not a, that's not, that's not a brainiac. Uh, that, no, we know that. Yeah. Storms cause struggle. Uh, second fact about our storms. The struggles are often related to the part of the life that best defines us. More often than not, we're struggling in that part of life that best defines who we are. I heard a preschool mom the other day who does a great job in raising all of her children say, I'm, I am really struggling at any of this. And my thoughts were, well, if you're struggling, everyone's struggling because, you know, she is one of those that seems to have things so, so to, together. But the proof is there. We will all struggle even in those moments where we are normally best defined. One of my mentors, a great pastor, the other day commented on some just some real daily normal struggles, and I'm thinking, wow, if you're struggling, it doesn't make sense. You're, you know, you're a strong leader, but a lot of times we, we struggle at that, at that point where we are best defined. Storms cause struggle. We struggle where we're best defined, but thirdly, sometimes even the common struggles overwhelm us. And 1 Corinthians 10, 15 says, let no temptation overtake you, but, but, God, but such is common to you, and God will allow a way of escape. But those common struggles can 
can feel so overwhelmed. And this is where the disciples are. And what did they learn? That Jesus is still there. He proved his presence in the storm. Now look at the fifth way that he impacted their lives. And we close here. The fifth way he impacted their lives. This, this might be the capstone of all of this. He, he settled their fear. He settled their fear. They're on this hillside full. Things are great. Jesus gives them the next instruction to travel over to Capernaum. They're in the midst of this torrent. Mark's gospel records that they were struggling with their oars. Veteran fishermen are in to their neck. They don't really understand how they're going to be able to survive this. And Jesus calms their fear. This is indeed the capstone of this portion of the miracle. How did he, how did he calm their fear? You know, he didn't say, hey, why are you whining? I've already given you a basket full of food. He didn't say that. He didn't say, hey, depend on your previous blessing. He didn't say that. How did he respond to their fears? Three ways. First, he proved that he could stand above the very thing that was blowing against them. He stood on the water. Scripture says that the disciples saw him, didn't know who he was, but it was Jesus walking on the waves to meet them. The very thing that caused them distress, Jesus was standing over. The psalmist says, the voice of the Lord is always over many waters. Would you imagine your storm in your hand for just a moment? There it is. There's the thing that is always causing me distress. There it is. Whatever that storm is, now please understand, that storm is subject to Jesus. He has authority over that which your life holds as the struggle. It's, it, it has to serve him. Your situation is always subject to Christ. You may say, well, it doesn't really go that way in my life. Well, I know for me, when I try to use human reasoning and calculation and human resources, my predicaments get the best of me because I'm not, I'm not honoring that, that they're already subject to Christ. I can just simply trust him. That was the first way he calmed their fear. He stood on the very thing. He stood on the water that was, that was becoming the threat to them. Secondly, how did he, how did he calm their fears? It, he just spoke. He said, don't be afraid, it's I. Uh, my three most favorite words in all of these miracles is Jesus saying, it is I. He spoke. John 16, verse 33 Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but I've overcome the world. I speak these to you so that you can have peace. Oh, church, do you know what it's like to live in peace? Some of you have had unbelievable storms in your life that I can never imagine. God's given you peace. Jesus is over the storm. You know that. So for, for your life, this testimony is just an echo of what you've been, you've been shown through the faithfulness of Jesus. But then there are others, maybe seated close to you, who are being so pelted by a storm right now, and maybe there's desperation and doubt that's setting in. The Scripture is saying that storm is subject, and Jesus is speaking to you. He, he calmed their fears by being on the storm. He calmed their fears by speaking to you. Third, this is my most favorite he calmed their fears by just getting in their boat. He got in their boat. Psalm 46.1 tells us that God is our very present help in the time of need. Jesus proved that, as he did many other times, in that boat. The scripture says the disciples received Jesus into their boat. I think the scripture is being kind to the disciples. I think they grabbed him and drug him in because their only source of rescue is there. And Jesus got in the boat. And they made it to where they were going safely because of who Christ is. Now, I, I pick up in verse 22 and read to verse 25 what happened even after this, how the crowd continued to clamor for Jesus. Jesus, where are you? Where are you? They're, they're seeking him for that personal desire of, of the sensational. But I love the disciples. They're in awe. From this point forward, 
They're leaning into Jesus, not because they fully understand him, because they understand that Jesus is doing something that is of God, that their life desperately needs and the world desperately needs. So I want to ask you this morning, looking at these miracles, looking at the outcome of these miracles, uh, which would describe your life better, which would describe my life better, the crowd or the disciples? Uh, the crowd is the spectator waiting for the sensational or, or something that that exhibits a quality that we can appreciate and say, oh, that's good. But the disciples are saying, Jesus, we want to know you beyond the sensational. We want to know your heart. We want to know you as the living bread. We want to cling to you when the, when the storm is tossing us. We, we want to hold tight to you. We want you in our boat. That's what the disciples are saying. So I pray that today we'll delineate out which is the best description of our lives the crowd of the disciples. I'm so grateful that God's allowed us to lean into these miraculous stories. I have this one truth proven. Philip Brooks wrote about it years ago. God works in our lives, not so that what happens around us can be called a miracle, but so that the real miracle can be us. God wants to do something fascinating in his people. We have to trust that he will make up for what is lacking as the hillside miracle reveals. We have to trust that when it doesn't look like things are going well, Jesus still has it, as the disciples learn on the storm tossed lake. Will you trust Jesus that he's doing incredible things and he wants to involve you if we'll just trust him for who he is? The miracle in me, yes, the miracle in you. Jesus wants to show himself to you so that you're alive comes a miracle that he can accomplish his purposes through. I praise God. Thank you for listening. And now, let's worship him. Let's stand for prayer.